Okay, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good to see you. That was a, sorry, for the, um, sorry for the confusion. Uh, I understand I'm the, the last thing uh, keeping you from lunch, so um, <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, it will be uh, worth uh, the wait. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, I've been to uh, the Warwick Economic Summit uh, several times, uh, and it's always been um, uh, a really interesting uh, time, so uh, looking forward to, to today. Um, it's also an exciting time uh, to be studying uh, economics because the world economy uh, is in the midst of a truly uh, great transformation which is going to shape um, uh, all uh, your lives. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the theme of my the talk is uh, the great uh, transformation, uh, how the rise of China, uh, India and other emerging economies uh, is changing the world uh, in unexpected ways. Now my starting point um, is that we live um, in an open world. In an open world uh, where economies and societies are increasingly open uh, to outside influences. So through finance, through firms uh, that operate uh, globally, uh, through fresh faces um, from afar, people with foreign backgrounds, Facebook, uh, foreign travel, fusion food, uh, and so on. An open world uh, that is confronted by common challenges uh, like climate change. An open world that is shaped um, by common uh, international rules and institutions like the trade rules at the WTO. An open world that is united uh, sometimes uh, by shared interests and values and sometimes uh, divided uh, by clashing ones. And above all, uh, an open world that is changing at a breathtaking pace. Now, if you think back only six years ago, uh, the West was booming, uh, house prices were skyrocketing, uh, share prices uh, were hitting uh, new heights. And now, uh, the West is struggling to emerge from uh, the worst financial crisis since the 1930s uh, and the longest period of stagnant living standards since the 19th century. You've seen in many places like Britain that house prices have plunged, uh, that banks have been uh, either collapsed or been rescued uh, by governments. And that now even governments uh, seem fragile. So you see that um, uh, people think uh, that it's more risky to lend uh, to Portugal uh, than it is uh, to Egypt, and that even the creditworthiness of the US government uh, is called into question. Or you think that only a few years ago, uh, people, many people thought that the euro might displace um, the US dollar as the world's premier uh, reserve uh, currency, and now uh, the fear is that it might uh, break up. Now that's the gloom and doom. There are also lots of good news going on. You see that against the backdrop of this terrible crisis, there's been the rapid development of things like smartphones, of tablets, of 3D printing, which is going to revolutionize manufacturing, of solar energy, uh, cheap and abundant, and other new technologies, and all of them have taken off in the past few years. At the same time, living standards across much of Asia uh, Latin America uh, and uh, Africa uh, have been uh, soaring and continue to soar uh, over the past few years. So that's why within countries like Britain, inequality uh, looms larger uh, than before. But across the world as a whole, uh, inequality uh, is narrowing uh, as the rest of the world catches up with the West. In fact, so much so that for the first time uh, since the Industrial Revolution, um, the West accounts for less than half of the world economy. And as the rest of the world rises, capitalism is becoming genuinely global for the first time, and old patterns of exchange are being reshaped. So you see that China has overtaken Germany as the world's biggest exporter. In fact, China exports more in six hours than it did in a whole year in 1978. It's now the biggest trading partner of much of the world. And soon it looks set to overtake the United States as the world's biggest economy. In the space of a decade, it's become the United States' biggest creditor. And increasingly, the world looks to Beijing rather than Washington for answers. But it's not just about China. You see India, it's the world's biggest exporter of IT services. Or Africa, which is a global leader in mobile banking 
Well, then look more broadly. Look at the world's 500 biggest companies by revenues. Back in 2003, only 31 were from outside the West. By 2009, that was up to 91. And last year, it was 125. So you see the world's biggest electronics company uh, is Korean, or the world's biggest steel company uh, is Indian, or the world's largest producer of iron ore is Brazilian, and so is the largest producer of regional airplanes. Or you see that nothing more quintessentially American than Budweiser beer is actually brewed by a Brazilian-run company. Or here in Britain, Britain's biggest manufacturer is an Indian company, Tata. Now, back uh, over a decade ago, I used to work as an advisor to the head of the World Trade Organization. At the time, we used to spend a lot of our time thinking, how can we help stimulate what was then called South-South trade? And now, you see that emerging economies, what we used to call developing countries, trade more with each other uh, than with uh, the West. In fact, this year, you can see that Chinese companies are set to invest um, more abroad uh, than foreign companies uh, invest in China. Again, a dramatic transformation. And it's not just about businesses, it's about people too. Globally, people are continuing to flock from the countryside to the cities. And for the first time in history, now more than half of the world lives in cities. But more broadly, people are moving in all directions. So you see that more Mexicans now move south from the US to Mexico uh, than north across the border. You'll see that Indian and Chinese entrepreneurs are leaving uh, Silicon Valley to set up uh, in uh, Bangalore or Beijing. Or you're seeing that China is increasingly a land of opportunity for Westerners. The number of Westerners living in Shanghai has gone up 13-fold in 13 years. I went there as, to interview people for my most recent book, Aftershock, and I met people, Westerners, who were doing you know, menial jobs, often there illegally, um, in China. And you think our concept of illegal immigrants is someone who comes uh, to this country, and actually you see Westerners doing it in China. That is the new world that's changing before our eyes. And why are they going to China? Because of the buzz and because of the chance to get rich. So the reality is that for people moving there, there is now also a Chinese dream as well as an American one. Or you see that more than 1% of, the, of the, the population of Portugal has moved uh, to uh, Angola uh, to work there in recent years. So truly epic transformation. And then you look at culture, you can see that increasingly people in the West are learning Mandarin in schools. A decade, nobody was. Or you see that increasingly people are speaking the language of Latinos, uh, Spanish. You see that Bollywood films are challenging Hollywood. You see that Brazil is going to host both the Olympic Games and the World Cup in the next few years. And then the most unlikely development of all, you see the way that Korean pop has taken the world by, by storm. <laughs> with Gangnam Style, the most downloaded clip on YouTube. Now, nobody would have thought that. Now, some or a lot of what I've said might now be familiar to you. A lot of this kind of stuff uh, is in the press. You might even have internalized it into the way you see the world. You might have start, started to think uh, that it is uh, normal. But the fact is, it remains absolutely revolutionary, the biggest change in the world economy for hundreds of years. And most importantly, it's actually unexpected. Because if you rewind 10 years, nobody was forecasting that the world economy would look uh, in 2013 uh, as it does now. I remember because back then I published my first book. It was called Open World, The Truth About Globalization. It was just after the financial crisis in Asia. Asia was dismissed as this hotbed of crony capitalism. China barely mattered in world trade. There Naomi Klein's No Logo was a bestseller, and there were anti-globalization protesters at every big international meeting. Back then, people said globalization amounts to rich countries exploiting poor ones. And now, those once poor countries, the developing countries, the emerging economies, are doing so well uh, that we're now uh, we are afraid uh, that our economies are submerging as theirs emerge. Or that, likewise, think back a few years. Now it seems obvious that the housing boom and the financial um, uh, excesses um, 
uh, were unsustainable. But back then, nobody predicted it. Nobody predicted that it would happen, that the crisis would happen in the way that it did. And that is an absolutely crucial insight for you in life, uh, in business, in whatever, is that the future is inherently unpredictable and that the conventional wisdom is usually wrong. And let me give you a very practical example. If you study economics or finance at university these days, you are taught standard models which assume that the future is basically a known probability distribution. You might not know uh, what the future is, but it's a known probability distribution. You know more or less how the economy and financial markets work, and you can, the, the choice of options about the future is points normally on a normal distribution. Now, that is a completely misunderstand, a complete, you know, uh, mis completely misleading view of actually the way the world works. We actually live in a world of fundamental uncertainty. We have only a very sketchy understanding of how the world works. We only have very limited information, and the future is inherently unpredictable. Now, I don't think this is a matter of academic debate. I think it is the essence of the human condition. But let me give you some examples. 35 years ago, it was after the Vietnam War, Watergate, uh, and so on, and many people thought that the Soviet Union and its communist allies were destined uh, to uh, dominate the world. Or go back 25 years ago. Japan was booming, and people expected that um, all conquering exporters like Sony and Toyota would run the world. Or 20 years ago, it was the launch of Europe's single market, and there was a wave of euphoria about uh, how Europe was going to dominate uh, the 21st century. Or 15 years ago, there was America's new internet economy, the internet bubble, and people assumed that companies like AOL and Yahoo uh, were going to dominate uh, the world. And even 10 years ago, after the bursting of the dot-com bubble, after 9-11, it was assumed that America's hyperpower, this was so unchallengeable that the 21st century was going to belong to America. And now, well now people assume that the world is going to be dominated by China. Now, perhaps it will be. Or perhaps, actually, its period of dominance will be short, and it will be overtaken by a younger and more dynamic India. Or perhaps China will never achieve dominance, and it will get stuck in a middle-income trap, as so many other fast-growing economies have done. Or perhaps the political tensions of this breakneck development will prove too great, and it will fracture into rival provinces, as it has happened before in previous eras in Chinese history. Now, I'm generally very positive and very bullish about China. But when an economy that big is growing that fast in a region where political tensions are so high and where the United States feel, feels threatened by China's rise and the West more generally does, then who knows what the future holds. So if you fast forward 5, 10 or 20 years, who knows which country will think is destined for glory. And if you think about it, that is just one uh, of the many questions that we have to ask about the future. Think about it in economics. Will America be able to sustain its fragile recovery? Will the euro hold together? Is the growing inequality we see in Britain and in the West more generally sustainable? How are we going to cope with our huge debts? Is the end result going to be inflation, like in the 1970s, or deflation, like Japan has had for the past two decades? Will China be able to shift its economy towards domestic consumption? Will India's baby boom generation be the demographic dividend that, that optimists hope for, or in fact, a drag that others fear? Where are the jobs and the businesses of the future going to come from? What new technologies are going to change the way that we live and work? Or perhaps, as some people say, has, have most of the innovations already happened and we're set for a period of stagnation? Are we going to tackle ta climate change? And if not, how are we going to adapt? Can the world cope with billions more people um, 
enjoying Western living standards. And last but not least, in these turbulent times, our economy is going to remain open uh, to products, uh, to investment, and to people. Or are we going to close ourselves off? And those are just some of the questions. These are the questions that we know about. But as my friend Nassim Taleb has argued, black swans, like the fall of the Berlin Wall, like 9-11, uh, or like the recent financial crisis, could overturn our assumptions overnight. Or as Donald Rumsfeld, the former defense secretary, and no, he's not a friend of mine, he said, there are things we know, and there are things we don't know, but the biggest challenge is unknown unknowns. The things we don't know, we don't know. Now, I've emphasized that the world is unpredictable. But that does not mean that you cannot shape it. On the contrary, each of us has a choice. We have a choice about how we behave as individuals, what our dreams are, whether and how we set out to achieve them, what our personal moral code is, and whether we live up to it. We have a choice in our working life. You know, what career do we go into? Which company do we work for? You know, what decisions do we make uh, in our business life? And we have a choice through the collective decisions that we make as voters. What kind of society, what kind of world do we want to live in? And how do we make it happen? And one of the most important choices we face in this age of great transformation is whether we want to defend and try to extend the peace, the prosperity, the freedoms of our increasingly open world, or that we're going to let it fragment, fall apart through neglect or through bad decisions. Now, you may assume that in 2013, globalization is inevitable and irreversible. But that's what many people thought in 1913, too. Now we had the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the Great Depression, the Second World War, and it all collapsed. And even before the recent crisis, our open world was more of a patchwork quilt than a seamless web. Because yes, it's true that you know, trade in manufacturing is pretty open, but it's not true in agriculture or services. Look at the airline business. You know, you can fly now thanks to EasyJet and Ryanair. You can fly pretty much, any company can fly pretty much where it wants uh, across uh, the European Union. But a European company cannot buy an American airline. And in Asia, uh, uh, the companies, uh, airlines can only fly uh, to very specific locations that dependent on where they are based. Or you look at foreign investment, which is regulated by thousands of rules, which is why, you know, if governments want to, they can try and keep out a Chinese investment. Or most importantly, look at mobility. It's amazing. Across the 27 countries of the European Union, people can move freely. But beyond that, mobility is highly restricted. So at best, then, the openness of our world is incomplete. And the sad news is that since the crisis, uh, some of that openness has been rolled back. So you've seen that even within Europe, finance is less international uh, than it was. You see that trade protectionism is rising, and you see that governments, most notably Britain, has made it much, much harder for people to come and go, toughening uh, immigration controls, making it harder for foreign students uh, to come uh, study here. And that's just the start, because the rise of the rest poses an even bigger danger, which is, is the West going to accept it? Is the West uh, going to uh, adjust to it? Is the West going to make the most of it? Or is the West going to try to resist? And that strategic choice is going to define uh, the global political economy in the coming decades, the world uh, that you and I live in. And there are ominous signs, because you see that many people in America and Europe uh, think uh, that China is a threat uh, to their jobs, uh, to their living standards, uh, to their futures, especially at a time when unemployment is so high. You can see, despite the fact that finally, in a few years, we've achieved cheap solar power, that American and European companies are trying to prevent um, that being exported uh, to us. 
Or you can see the worries about uh, foreign investment, where you see that Chinese companies are being prevented from investing in, US, in the US and Europe. And there's this bigger fear, which is that you know, people feel bewildered by all this change over which they feel they have no control. And they feel resentful of these seemingly, reno res seemingly remote uh, governing classes and global uh, elites. And so you see that nationalism and populism is on the rise. Look at how well the National Front has done uh, in France. Uh, look uh, at the rise of UKIP in this country. And you see the pressures to erect new barriers, to turn inwards, uh, to stamp on novelty and differences. But if you treat foreigners, the new and the different, as a threat, if you treat the rise of emerging economies as a threat, then in a sense it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because it prompts others to have nationalist and protectionist responses. It encourages the development of new relationships uh, that would fragment uh, the open world uh, that we have created. And it undermines, undermines the chances of cooperation in all sorts of areas, uh, like climate change. So I take a different perspective. I think you should too. Which is that it surely ought to be a cause for celebration that life is looking up for most of the rest of the world. Because think back, as recently as 1981, over half of the developing world was living in extreme poverty. That's below $1.25 a day. And that includes, at that time, many Chinese. And by 2008, it was down from a half to 22% or slightly higher, the level of global poverty, which is $2 a day, and you see a fall from 70% to 43%. Now, $2 a day doesn't sound very much, but it goes much further in rural India than it does uh, in Coventry. In fact, global poverty is falling at the fastest rate in history. In India, average incomes have doubled between 1994 and 2008. In China, average incomes have multiplied by 10, by 10 between 1980 and 2008. In fact, that's why people say that now around half of the world uh, is uh, developing, it, half of the developing world is now middle class. Now this is really fantastic news. It offers much greater opportunities for millions of people, billions of people, uh, to enjoy some of the things that we take for granted. It will make the world a much fairer uh, and safer place. And it can benefit people in the West too. New jobs, new businesses, new technologies, a wider choice of cheaper and better imports. Now, of course, if you've grown up in the West, whether you internalize it or not, more or less you assume that basically uh, the West uh, is destined uh, to run the world. That is how it has been for the past 200 years. And that shift, that realization that actually it's someone else's turn is emotionally difficult. I don't think it's a bad thing, but it's emotionally difficult. But at the same time, while the share of the economy, um, the world economy, uh, which uh, the West runs, uh, is shrinking, the living standards of people in the West will continue uh, to rise. Because you see America, which profited from Europe's rise. You see America and Europe, which profited from Japan's rise. And likewise, we can all benefit from the rise of emerging economies. Not just cheaper imports, but better ones. Not just imitated technologies, but innovative ones. People and ideas moving in both directions. So you see that Brazil could help feed the world. You can see that China is the world's fastest growing consumer market, and that Chinese, consumer, Chinese uh, tourists could soon become as ubiquitous as the Japanese are. Look at Harrods, for example. A third of its sales now go to Chinese tourists. Now, if you think about, think about it, until recently, we were only tapping the brain power of a tiny fraction of humanity. It's only been 100 years that there's been mass education in the West, and now uh, those opportunities are being spread to the rest of the world. So look, a guy like Wang Tran Fu, he's the founder of BYD, he grew up on a farm in extreme poverty in China in a country where enterprise was forbidden. And now uh, the electric cars that his companies makes are at the cutting edge of technology, something that benefits not just him, but the rest of the world. So just think how much faster and further humanity could progress if Africa emulated China's success, if women were liberated in the Arab world, 
if people were set free to live and work wherever they want, if Silicon Valley's entrepreneurial magic uh, was spread in Europe, and if every child got a fair start in life. Now, achieving that requires all sorts of changes, but above all, it requires optimism. The optimism to try to improve things, to invest in the future, and to embrace change. The optimism that views challenges, even crises as bad as this one, as opening up new opportunities. The optimism that leads us to open our, our economies, to open our societies, and open our minds to the opportunities of the future. This is a really exciting time to be studying economics and to be starting out on your working life. You have the power to change things for the better. I trust that you'll use it well. Thank you. Okay, so we have around um, just over probably about seven minutes for questions. So can we have some questions, please? Yep. So we've got one right at the back on the left hand. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just thinking, because you briefly mentioned like um, the positioning of China in the future as a possible world le leader, possibly not, possibly India will come in, possibly China will have a brief, brief stint as world leader and India will come in. I was just thinking, um, how important would being a democracy play in that? I mean, for instance, India claims to be the world's largest democracy. China isn't what we would really consider a democracy. So how important would that be in future world economic positioning? Thank you. That, that's a very good question. Um, there are two arguments that are often made. One is that as country, once countries reach a certain level of development, they become democracies. And the argument that's often made is because of the rise of the middle class, um, who have greater spending power and autonomy in their personal life, they also want um, a greater um, say in how an economy is run. And there's another argument which is made, which is in order to um, become a mature economy that um, uh, grows uh, through inventing new ideas, uh, that you need to set people free to think creatively, otherwise that innovation won't come. Now, I don't think those are iron rules. I mean, I think they're cor broad correlations, and, and there are exceptions. Uh, the biggest, I mean, it's a, it's a tiny exception, but the most notable exception is Singapore. Uh, Singapore, which is um, uh, richer than most of Europe, um, uh, and which remains an autocracy. Okay, it's officially it's a democracy, but it's always the same, it's always the same party that wins, and um, it certainly doesn't have freedom of speech. Um, what will happen in China? Well, at the moment, the middle classes who have got um, uh, much, much richer, uh, well, everyone's got richer, but the middle class in particular have got particularly rich over the past few decades. Um, they certainly desire um, greater rule of law and a greater accountability, but I'm not sure they're that keen on democracy because much like in Britain in the 19th century, they're afraid that de democracy would lead to taxation, which would mean the loss of the wealth uh, that they've accumulated. Um, so... What, what, what the future holds for China, I think, is, 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 is uncertain. The second question, which is, can, can China um, uh, prosper, uh, develop new technologies while not being a democracy? Well, I think in, in, in many areas it already is. It's a, it's, 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 it's a striking mix. In some, in some respects, it's a very backward economy. In other respects, it's a very um, uh, cutting-edge one. In some respects, in fact, um, it is a global innovator. Um, so I'm not sure that's true either. Um, so it's... Um, there are reasons to say that um, once you reach a certain element, it's likely to happen. You know, it happened dramatically, for example, in South Korea with the Olympics. Um, it's happened elsewhere in Asia. Um, you can see that people are much freer in China than they were before. They're much freer, to, they're much um, uh, more able to express their opinions through things like Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter. Um, but I wouldn't hold my breath about a rapid transition uh, to democracy. Okay. All right, so we have a question over here as well in the corner. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. You talked about how the idea of emerging economies would bring about a narrowing of inequality, the idea of, and also mentioned how many people have been brought out of poverty in emerging economies. The problem is that many people are also being left behind. In South Africa, for example, the fall of apartheid allowed a great many people to come out of poverty, 
but it's also left a lot trapped behind, and there's very little being done to resolve this. The same happens in India, where I think about 60% of people living below the poverty line are still expected to live in middle-class economies. Considering the history of inequality as being very entrenched in society, and there's not necessarily any indication that this will continue until everybody is middle-class, do you think that, A, assuming that these com economies do continue growing, what will be the impact of having such a massive rift of inequality? Do you think anything is going to be done about this? And what do you think will ultimately the long-term uh, effects for these economies when we consider how future countries will try to build up their own uh, development? Sure. Okay. Well, you made it. It's, a, it's an important question. Um, the first thing to say, as I said, at a global level, inequality is narrowing. Um, there are widening inequalities within economies, uh, both uh, in the West uh, and um, outside it. Clearly, while globalization has been a huge motor for development, uh, it's not um, uh, the only factor involved, and it's certainly not uh, the only th factor which determines um, the distribution of income in a country. South Africa is a country I looked into quite carefully, um, and one of the reasons why inequality has been uh, remained so large uh, since the fall of apartheid is because of the absence of land reform. Uh, which is you see that, you know, that the, the land is still mostly held by whites um, uh, and it hasn't been redistributed um, uh, to uh, black, black uh, and coloured people. And that has been uh, a huge uh, challenge. And that's clearly also a factor um, uh, in India. Secondly, obviously, is the role of government policy. You look at a place like Brazil and you see that um, contrary to the, the pattern of development that you've seen um, in other economies, that actually living standards for the bottom 10% have been rising faster than those for the top 10%. Uh, why is that? Uh, because there's been a whole series of progressive policies, for example, um, uh, the Bolsa Familia and other um, cash transfers, um, which not only boost living standards, but also um, encourage um, um, people to go to school, get good health care, and so on. So I think there, it, the responsibility for tackling inequality of that, that, of that nature still lies at the, at the level uh, of national governments. Um, in the context of, uh, of economies which are growing faster and therefore catching up with the West, you can narrow the, it, the, the distribution of income within a country uh, through suitable reforms. Okay, I think we have time for one more if we're brief. So if we go for the one in the middle there. Uh, hi, mm, this doesn't work. Uh, I want to ask you, um, do you think that the West will be able to sustain its net immigration surplus for much longer? And if so, for how much longer? What do you mean by net immigration surplus? People coming to live and work in uh, the Western countries from the developing world. Well, like I said, there's already been a dramatic transformation. Take a country like Spain. Spain, over the past decade, received more um, migrants than um, the rest of the European Union put together. Um, and then you've seen that since the crisis hit, and not only have there been many Latin Americans returning to Latin America, but also you've seen Spaniards going to work um, uh, in uh, Germany and further afield. Um, I think um, that our, our view of migration as being something which is a, you know, almost exclusively from uh, south to north um, and east to west uh, is hopelessly out of date. And I think those people who say, well, you know, even now we're much richer than them and therefore everyone's going to come here, um, has got their kind of model of immigration a bit wrong. It's not just the level of income that matters, it's also the opportunities that exist. And so, and so, so long as, as unemployment remains high uh, in the West and so long as uh, growth is very rapid and therefore there are lots of opportunities in emerging economies, uh, you're going to see uh, people moving in different directions. And you can see that um, uh, with... Um, there's been a huge outflow of Brazilians from the United States back to Brazil. Uh, you've seen, um, uh, uh, as I said, that the flows I've talked about, not Portuguese, not just uh, to Angola, uh, but also to Brazil, to Mozambique. Most of them are former colonies where they speak uh, Portuguese. So I think, yes, that, I think that, metal, that, that, met, that mental model um, uh, is, is incorrect. The other thing to say is that migration is increasingly temporary. Uh, it's not this kind of movement of permanent, set, permanent, pe permanent, permanent settlement that people think it is. Very often it's just you know, moving somewhere temporarily for work. And that shouldn't be really that surprising. It's what you know, 
American bankers and, and people who work for European multinationals have been doing for decades, and now it's being democratized. You know, so you can see Polish people who come to this country who uh, spend six months here working as a builder and then go home and build their own home uh, in, uh, in Poland back over the summer. Uh, or you see that people who move from uh, country to country uh, as new opportunities arise. Again, British builders in the Middle East um, uh, and so on. So I think um, uh, the, the, what's emerging is uh, a, a, a patchwork of, a, of beginnings of a, of a global labor market, uh, very much in its inf infancy, um, uh, and one where people are moving in all directions, often temporarily. Okay, I'm thank afraid you. we don't have time for any more questions, so can we thankfully again for his talk? Thank you.